So it seems a little off to talk about swimming right now because we just keep getting dumped on with snow. But for just a second, I think for all of our mental sake, let's just fast forward to summer for just a second. D- does anyone actually like to go into the shallow end of a pool? I mean, besides toddlers, either at a community pool or a water park, like I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but the shallow end continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It used to be a separate pool all by itself. Like years ago, it used to be these separate little pools called baby pools. I don't know if you remember these. They were separated from the main pool, but over time they have disappeared. And what they've done is they've merged themselves into the main pool, and we call it now the shallow end. And it's great for little kids. It's awesome. That's what it's meant for. But you don't want to be there for a plethora of reasons. Number one, the water is shin high at best. So you don't even get to swim. You just get to sit in water while the rest of your body that's above the 12-inch water line just gets baked by the sun. So it's not even refreshing. And while you are sitting in 12 inches of water not being refreshed, you start to notice that the water in the shallow end is particularly warm. You know why it's warm, right? And so so you start to notice things just kind of floating by you that you can't identify. It's just... It's very disturbing. But they keep making the shallow end bigger and actually you're trying to make it more inviting and more enticing for you to be there. Now there's toys, there's walk-in features, that have, you know, a lot of those beach features where you can just walk into 12 inches of water. There are fountains that spray that recycled warm water on top of your head, which is great. Then there's chairs for parents to sit in right there in the middle of the water. The shallow end is meant to invite you to be a part of it. And it's great if you're a kid. That's who we've got to remember it for. It's for small kids. But if you saw a grown man in the shallow end by himself wearing goggles playing without kids, you're going to have some concerns, aren't you? You might even call the cops. Yeah, hi, officer. There's a grown man here playing with some toy boats by himself in the shallow end. No, he doesn't have kids with him. He looks like he's 30, and he's wearing goggles and a snorkel mask and 12 inches of water. You might want to come quickly. That's just weird, right? And why would you choose the shallow end when over here you've got the deep end? The deep end is awesome. It has a high dive. Who likes high dives? Yeah, I'm all in on the high dive. It's great. The deep end, the water is much cooler. There is space for you to swim. You can actually swim in the deep end as opposed to the shallow end. You can go down deep. There's freedom in the deep end. So why would anybody, besides toddlers, why would anybody pick shallow over deep? Now that's actually a serious question because outside of swimming, why would anybody choose shallow over deep? But this is a decision that gets made over and over and over again to the point where I start to wonder, can we actually distinguish between what's really shallow and what's actually real? What actually has some depth? Now I don't know where you're at personally, but I know where I've been. And I've speak to enough people that I can start to see trends in people's lives. And one of the things I see right now is there's a major disconnect. So do you feel disconnected? I know that's broad. Like, Matt, what, disconnected from what? I'm, I'm being vague on purpose to start. Just think about these. Don't raise your hand, but just think about this. Have you ever felt like, or maybe you feel like right now, that you just have guilt and shame following you like a dark cloud? Or do you feel like your life is missing joy? You're just joyless all the time. Or what about temptation? Whatever it is that you're tempted by, do you feel like temptation is getting stronger and stronger and you just, you can't help but fall into it? Or are you starting to confuse lies for truth? Like, do you feel spiritually weak? Do you feel like your faith is timid now? Are people noticing changes in you that aren't good? And maybe you even have somebody pointing that out to you. Do you feel like frustration is a, It's just like a normal operating system for you. Or that's hard to sense. Or maybe you don't even feel connected to Jesus. Or maybe you feel like your life is missing some kind of some kind of substance, some kind of depth, maybe missing some kind of power. Those are all just symptoms. They're just symptoms of being disconnected. Which is very easy to do because we live in a culture that cares and elevates surface level over substance. Superficial surface level living, man, that's a curse of our day. And one of the ways that it plays out is an instant gratification. Like instant gratification has become a religion in in and to itself. 
Like we want gratification, satisfaction all the time, right away in every area of our lives. And if you think I'm overstating that point, just look at our attention spans. They're non-existent now, right? You know, if I don't connect a Wi-Fi immediately on my Southwest flight so that I have high definition on-demand movies at 30,000 feet, I'm getting frustrated. This actually just happened to me two weeks ago. And you can ask some of the staff that were with me. I was frustrated because I couldn't watch stuff on, on, uh, on my phone. Man, I just think about that. High-speed internet, mid-flight on a plane. Dial-up was not that long ago. Like, can you imagine today if you and I had to go back to dial-up, what would happen? We would lose our minds, right? Because patience is almost non-existent today. Man, we want gratification right now, and if we don't get it, then someone or something else is to blame, or it wasn't worth waiting for in the first place. Instant gratification has become this religion that undercuts the desire that every person has. You have this desire, and so do I. A desire for something real, something with substance, something that's authentic, some power. But that doesn't just happen when you snap your fingers. Death takes time, it takes work. Instant gratification, while we sabotage that, if you want depth, it takes time, it takes some effort, but we don't like that, so we settle for shallow. We live in a shallow world, a world that loves to hang out and play in the shallow end, and it will invite you to play in the shallow end all the time. In fact, it's making the shallow end more and more enticing, trying you to get to hang out there instead of the deep end. And this goes across the board, it's this shallow in culture that we live in. I mean, you can see it in relationships. Let's just keep our relationships on the surface level or just keep them behind a keyboard. Don't ever give yourself all away in a relationship. Don't totally be real, totally invest yourself, whether it's a friend or a family member or your spouse or people in your small group. Because if you're totally real, if you're totally invested, then what happens is you have to be vulnerable. And if you're vulnerable, that's when you actually could get hurt. So we believe that the best way, the most safe way to have a relationship is to say surface level. But really what happens is surface level only keeps you safe from experiencing depth in a relationship. I don't care what kind of relationship it is. Or maybe it's a shallow in culture when it comes to money. Where we view money as our primary source of satisfaction and security. That actually it's our primary source and most important source of status. It's a really shallow view of money. And if you have that view of money, by the way, you're always going to have a scarcity mindset when it comes to money. Or maybe a shallow in culture when it comes to influence and power. Like everybody's got some influence and some power in their lives. No matter what amount of influence and power you've got, a shallow in culture will say, hey, that's meant for your own gratification. Use your influence, use your power to propel your goals, your career, your agenda. Don't use it for something bigger than yourself. Or a shallow in culture when it comes to faith. Man, the Western world looks at Christianity as a life accessory instead of being the source of life transformation. Man, it's just an accessory. So if Jesus isn't working out for you, this whole church thing, that's not working out for you, just change out accessories. Try something different. Or a shallowing culture with recognition. That's when recognition is put almost at the very top of the importance hierarchy. You got to get recognized. You got to get recognized. We confuse recognition with value. A dopamine hit you get with however many likes, followers you have, shares, retweets. Well, that must, that must validate me as a person. Because whatever gets recognized is real. But often the opposite is true. Whatever's real rarely gets recognized in a shallow in culture. Or what about virtue? In a shallow culture, virtue signaling is actually elevated above actual virtue. I think if we're all being honest and we just take a step back and we just look around, I think for the most part we would agree that we live in a shallow world. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't depth in different places, but for the most part, our, our world will settle for shallow all the time. Now, you're always being formed by something. We've hit on this over and over again in this series. You're always being formed by something. My question to you is, are you being formed by the shallowness in our world? I can't speak for you, I'll just speak for myself. This is a daily battle for me. Because if I'm not paying attention, I will trade depth for shallow every single time. Because that's what I'm offered daily, and so are you. That's the world I live in, so do you. But what if we don't have to? 
Like, what if there is depth, like real depth? What if there is real substance? What if there is real power, real authenticity? What if there is joy and discernment between truth and lies? What if there is freedom from, from shame and guilt? Like, what if there is transformation that not only you can see in yourself, but other people can see in you? What if there is victory over temptation? What if there is a deep connection to Jesus? What if that is possible? What if there is an opportunity where you can actually hear his voice? What if we could live a life that is marked by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? What if all of that stuff is actually real? Hear me on this. For someone who follows Jesus to not have those things... That's like starving to death in the middle of a grocery store. What you're starving for is right here. You just have to take it. And the world is starving for changed people. Starving for it. People that are real, people with depth, they they wouldn't be able to say it this way, but they're starving for people that have spiritual fruit. And we're all about this, but we tend to just think at the macro level too often. You know, I want to see the world changed by Jesus. Well, amen, bro, me too. Like, I want to see the world changed by Jesus. But maybe I need to pump the brakes on the world for a second and just look at me. I maybe, maybe I just need to look in the mirror and, and check out me first before the world gets changed. What about me? Leo Tolstoy, the famous Russian author and poet, he said, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one ever thinks of changing himself. I think that's really good. But I would argue against Tolstoy. I would argue that people try to change themselves all the time, all the time. Gyms, diets, therapy, hobbies, self-discovery, learning. I mean, the list goes on. And there's always a place for those kind of things, and and they're helpful, but those things can only change surface-level things. Real change in the depths of you that creates depth in you, that kind of change only comes from Jesus, only. There's a classic conversation in John 15. If you've spent any amount of time in a church before, you've probably heard this conversation. And if this is all new to you, let me set it up to you. This is Jesus, and he's, he's talking to his 12 disciples. These are his apprentices. They're following him. He's shaping them. He's forming his life in them. That's what we call spiritual formation. And then he says this in John 15. This is verse 4 and 5. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You're the branches. Those who remain in me and I am them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. This is just another example of the law of returns. The law of returns has two parts. First part, every cause has an effect. The second part, the effect is often disproportionate to the cause. Jesus right here is not just talking to the 12 disciples. He's very much talking to you and to me. And the cause and the effect in this conversation, he says, hey, you can stay connected to me, you can remain in me, and you'll produce much fruit, or you can be apart from me, disconnected from me, and you can do nothing. So the effect, stay connected to him, remain in him, stay connected to Jesus, or be apart from him, disconnected. And the cause is you will either produce much fruit by being connected to him, all that good stuff we talked about a second ago, or if you're disconnected from him, you can do nothing. Shallow is just really another way of saying nothing. So what I think is really important for you and I to remember is who you're connected to shapes who you are. Who and what you're connected to shapes who you are, good or bad, always good or bad. So I think the obvious question then is, how? Like how do you actually stay connected to the vine? How do you remain, how do you stay connected to Jesus? And one of the simplest ways that actually takes a lot of discipline and one of the ways that's most overlooked and definitely undervalued is something we call spiritual disciplines or spiritual practices. And in my opinion, we've lost a lot of this in the Western world. Now, at first you might think, well, hear the word disciplines and think, well, that's a real buzzkill. It's not, I promise. It's actually the opposite. Proverbs 10, 17 says, those who accept discipline are on the pathway to life. Those who ignore correction, they go astray. Spiritual disciplines are meant to keep you connected to the vine. That's what they're for. The entire purpose of spiritual disciplines is spiritual formation. Intimacy, connection with Jesus, relationship with him, growing fruits. 
And you and I know that to grow anything, to have any kind of progress and any kind of change, it takes discipline. It does. And that starts with submission. That's another word that we don't really like, right? I don't even like saying the word submission up here. I can just feel you all go like this real quick, right? It's a weird word. But shaping starts with submission. What I mean is you can't just say, you know, I'm going to shape myself into something and just that happens that day. It doesn't work that way. You know, a guy that decides that he wants to be a Navy SEAL doesn't say, you know what, I'm going to be a SEAL, and then, bam, it happens. If, if it worked that way, I would already be a fighter pilot, a PGA Tour pro, a Navy SEAL, and a cowboy. I would be all four things. <laughs> That's not how it works. No, the guy that decides he wants to be a SEAL submits himself to a process that's full of disciplines, and then over time, he's shaped into a SEAL. You can't just say, I want to be something, and then it happens. And you submit yourself to the gym and to pain to shape you physically into something that actually feels good and helps you live better. You submit yourself to the mental grind of school to shape your mind and your skills so you can be an engineer. You submit yourself to counseling so you can shape a better and stronger marriage. If you want to be something, then you get to do something. Well, I want to be more connected to Jesus. I personally want to be more like Jesus. I want the depth and the authenticity of Jesus. I want my life to produce much fruit. Spiritual disciplines give me a role in that. Now, I want to be really clear. I want to be super practical on this. Super clear on what what these are and what they're not. The spiritual disciplines are not a religious checklist that makes you good. That's not what they are at all. If you approach any of them that way, then you will never leave the shallow end you probably will become arrogant, maybe both. That's what happened with the Pharisees. These do not make you good. They do not save you. We are saved by grace through faith alone, not by good works. That's Ephesians 2.8. What makes you good, what saves you, is your belief, your faith in Jesus, that he is God, that he did live in perfection, that he did pay the penalty that's attached to your sin by dying for you on the cross, and that he did resurrect from death to life three days later. That's what makes you good. That's what saves you. That's where grace comes from. The spiritual disciplines are just meant to be a way to receive that grace. Now, I'm not talking about saving grace. I'm talking about the grace that's needed for you and I to be changed, to be transformed from the inside out, because you can't change yourself from the inside out. Neither can I. Even though we're going to keep trying to do that, we try to do that all the time. And every single New Year's resolution and every single marketing campaign is targeted at that. That you can change yourself. Just do this thing over here or buy that product. Now, you might be able to do some behavioral modification. You might be able to change up your behavior for some some time. And that's cool. But behavioral modification is just simply taking a lawnmower and running over weeds. Unless you get the root, what's going to happen? Weeds are going to come back. This is why we find ourselves in the same mess in the world over and over again, why we fall into the same trap every single generation, one after the other, and sometimes I feel like it's getting worse. Because we bought into this idea that an individual can change themselves from the inside out, but we can't. We need Jesus in his grace, not just to be saved, but also to be changed, to be shaped, to produce much fruit to look more and more like Jesus, to have depth and substance and be real. I love what a guy by the name of Richard Foster says about this. He says, spiritual disciplines allow you to place yourself before God so he can transform you. That's what spiritual disciplines do. They're a pathway that leads to life. The path doesn't produce transformation. The path simply puts you in a spot where God can transform you. That's being connected to Jesus. Spiritual disciplines connect you to the divine. And if what you're connected to shapes who you are, then what are your disciplines right now and what are they really connecting you to? Because you have all kinds of disciplines. So do I. You're being shaped by all different kinds of things. My question is, is that intentional or accidental? Do you really know what your disciplines are and what they're shaping you into, what they're connecting you to? If we step back and look and we're honest, are we disciplined to be connected to our phones all the time? Constantly scrolling, social media, texting. I mean, are we disciplined to always be connected to our phones? And I'm not calling anybody out. This is at me right now. You can see this everywhere, too. People at a restaurant, 
waiting to board a flight, not talking to each other, just looking at their phones, right? I do it too. I was in a, a coffee shop this week, and there was a group of high school students that came in. They were all together, but they weren't talking to each other. They were just looking at their phones. But then at a restaurant, this one hit hard for me. I was at a restaurant, and the table next to me, dad and, and his daughter, she looked like she was about 9 or 10 years old. Maybe they were on a daddy-daughter date. They're sitting across from each other, facing each other, but they weren't talking to each other. They barely even looked at each other, both of them looking down at their phones. If you're disciplined to be connected to your phone all the time, that will erode your ability for community. It will, it will hinder your interaction in relationships, and it will raise levels of anxiety. We have data on that now. now. I mean, phones are great. I mean, the technology, it's, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all in. It's, it's fantastic. Like, I'm an iPhone guy. Some of you guys are Android people. I don't know why you are, but I'm like, I'm, I'm in. I'm in. The green bubble is a curse, okay? The phones are great. There's nothing wrong with the phones. It's our discipline to be connected to them all the time. That's the problem. I'm a millennial. We are the most connected generation in the history of mankind. And at the same time, we are the generation that feels the most disconnected from actual community. That's a problem. Or are we disciplined to be busy all the time? That if we're always going, if we're always busy, if we always got something going on, if we always double book ourselves, well, that means you must be doing something worthwhile and you must be a pretty admirable person if you're always busy. Always going, always going. I mean, busyness is, is somehow, it's somehow become a badge of honor in our culture. So much so that it's, it's become our default response. Like if you ask somebody, if somebody says, hey, how have you been? What's almost always the response? Yeah, I'm busy. Yeah, I'm busy. Like, that's it? Really? We've been trained that much? We're so disciplined to be busy that that's how we respond to people? I'm busy? Man, that's just a sign of being shaped by a shallow culture. Or what about connected to constant noise? Are we disciplined to do that? This one, man, I do this one very easily without paying attention to it. Whether it's just always listening to a podcast or some music, having earbuds in the majority of the time, having a show on in the background, going to a loud coffee shop. I mean, all that stuff is good. It's great. But if I discipline myself to always be connected to noise, then what I'm actually doing is I'm robbing myself of the gift of silence, which it is a gift. We don't do silence well, but it's a gift. And I also rob myself the gift of reflection. Constant noise never leads to calm. It leads to mental chaos. It could be all different kinds of things. Maybe discipline to be a consumer, discipline to numb out on Netflix, discipline to play video games, discipline to always check my sports team and see what's going on with the Broncos. Where, where is their draft status at? Actually, they're not drafting at all this year. Always discipline. Some of you got that, okay? Always discipline to be connected to something else. And I bet you could go home today and you could fill pages with your disciplines. Might take a little reflection, but you could come up with pages of things that you are disciplined to do. And here's my bet, is that if you dig down deep into them to see what they really are, what they're really connecting you to, and what they're really shaping you into, my bet is you would want to break most of them. Instead, what if you could have the same disciplines that Jesus himself practiced? Disciplines that Christians for the last 2,000 years have been doing to keep them connected to the vine so that they can bear much fruit so they can look more and more like Jesus, so they can be people of depth and substance that the world desperately needs. Now, I can't go through every single spiritual discipline. We could do an entire series on those. All I want, you, all I want for you today is just to reflect on this for a second. Maybe you know what I'm going to get into right here, and you, you know spiritual disciplines and you do them. Then this is a reminder and encouragement to you. Keep going. Keep going. Keep staying connected to the vine. And if this is all brand new to you, I just want, to, I want you to look at to see what you're really connected to, what you're really disciplined to do, and maybe consider that there might be something else. Maybe you can start a discipline today that Jesus himself has done and that Christians for 2,000 years have done so that you can be connected to the vine. Some of the classic spiritual disciplines, like prayer. Prayer is a spiritual discipline. It's being connected in community with God. It's trying to be in his presence. I read an interview with Mother Teresa and the guy that was interviewing her said, hey, what do you do when you pray? What do you say when you pray? And she says, I, I rarely say anything. I just mainly listen. And he said, oh, well, that, that's admirable. That's great. Okay, since you listen, what does God say to you? And she said, well, God usually doesn't say anything either. He just listens also. It's just putting yourself in his presence. It's not always asking. 
Man, I, you've heard me say this before, that one of my favorite prayers is out of 1 Samuel 3. Samuel says this, speak, Lord, your servant listens. That's almost a daily prayer for me in the morning. I'll say that, and then I don't say anything for a while. That's hard at times. My mind is always going 10,000 miles an hour. I know some of you are like that too. And I get distracted really easily. But whenever I get distracted, that's just a reminder. Okay, go back. Speak, Lord, your servant listens. I just want to be with him and listen. Or another spiritual discipline. It could be meditation, the study of scripture, fasting. Fasting is one that it's hard for me, but it's definitely one of the most impactful. And it's definitely one of the most powerful ones too. Fasting is creating dependence and making you be dependent on the Lord. You could fast from, you know, social media or technology. That's great. Um, but whenever scripture talks about fasting, it's talking about food. When Jesus is in the desert, fast for 40 days, gets tempted by Satan. He starts quoting Deuteronomy. He says, man does not live on bread alone, but the word of God. Fasting is meant for you to forget food, and I'm going to live on God's word. So every time you get hungry when you're fasting, it's a reminder. I live on God's word. Go to his word. Pray. My quiet time is the best when I'm fasting. Best. It also prepares you. There's a spot in the Gospels where the 12 disciples were trying to cast out demons and, and they couldn't do it. And they go back to Jesus and they're like, hey, man, you said we could do this. Why can't we do this right here? And Jesus says these demons require prayer and fasting. They couldn't pray and fast right in the moments. They had to do it beforehand. It prepares you for whatever obstacle or whatever spiritual battle that's coming. Fasting creates dependence on God. It makes you rely on him and it prepares you for whatever's next. Or maybe the spiritual discipline of silence and solitude. This is something we really have a hard time in the 21st century United States because we're always connected. We're connected to noise. We're always busy. But silence and solitude. Go be by yourself and be quiet. If you're a parent of young kids, that sounds like heaven. That sounds amazing. But whenever you separate yourself to be alone and be quiet to just listen to God, shut everything off. Sabbath, it's the biggest gift of the Ten Commandments. I'm going to rest. I'm not going to do the day-to-day -day work stuff one day a week. God did this when he created the world, so we probably should do it too. And it's a gift. Sabbath is praying and playing. I'm going to spend time with the Lord. I'm going to do things that rejuvenate me, that give me life, that I enjoy. So for me, my Sabbath looks like, hey, my quiet time in the morning. And then we're going to, in the winter, we're going skiing. We're going to go ski with the kids. Or in the summer, I'm going to play golf. Or we're going to hang out with friends. Or we're going to go to dinner as a family. Or the spiritual discipline of confession. Confessing your sin. And this isn't just confessing to everybody. And don't confess all your sin on Facebook either. That's not admirable. Don't do that either. James says, if you confess your sin to one another, you will be healed. So who are the close people in your life that you can go to and say, hey, here's where I've screwed up. I need to confess this to you. Because when you confess it, it has no power over you. You bring sin out into the light, it can't survive. Sin in the dark is where it has power. Just think about what grows in the darkness. Nasty things. Mold, mushrooms, right? Nasty things grow in the darkness. That stuff, fungus, it cannot grow in the light. When you confess your sin to close friends or people that you're in relationship with, people that might, you might have a relationship in your small group, it takes the power away from it. There's healing that comes from that. A spiritual discipline of service. Jesus came to serve, not be served. That's one of the reasons why we serve here on the weekends. Not just so we can do some stuff, but so we can model our lives after Jesus. There is a spot on every single serve team that we have here on Sunday mornings for everyone here. And we have plenty of needs. That's just here on Sunday mornings. It doesn't even include out in, in the world. Or the spiritual di discipline of worship. We don't sing songs here just to create a mood and a vibe. It's not that at all. It's to respond to God's word. It's a spiritual discipline. I'm going to acknowledge who you are, God, and I'm going to worship you. It connects you to the vine. I mean, and there's so many more. But I want you to hear one thing that I've learned over the years. This has been so true for me. And if you've been around me before, my guys in my small group, they've heard me say this multiple times. Here's what happens. Over time, discipline turns to delight. I promise you this happens. Maybe you've experienced this before with like going to the gym. You decide you want to go to the gym so that you can shape yourself and you can be physically healthy and live better. So you start going to the gym. And at first, it is a discipline. You don't like going, it's hard, you find it very easy to talk yourself out of going, it's a discipline. But then over time, you start enjoying going to the gym. 
It becomes a delight. You, you start looking forward to it. You get better at it too. You start getting competent in the gym. You're not that awkward person trying to lift weights that you look at them and think they're going to hurt themselves. Somebody go help them. You're not that person anymore. No, you've gotten better. It's turned into a delight for you. I promise you that this is exponentially more true with spiritual disciplines. Disciplines always turn to a delight. The place that I've experienced this the most for me is the two spiritual disciplines of meditation and study of scripture. By far and away, these are my two favorite. Psalm 1, verse 1 and 2 says this. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with the mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord. Law of the Lord, that's another way of saving God's word. They delight in God's word, meditating on it day and night. The best time of the day, every single day for me, is early in the morning. I get up before the kids. Most of the time I'm up before Kelly. I go downstairs. I sit in the exact same spot every day. In the summer, I'm on my front porch. I've got my cup of coffee in one of my favorite mugs because mug selection is important. It is. Don't mess with my mugs, right? Everybody's got a favorite mug. I just start reading God's Word. I've got a reading plan that I go off of, and I read it slow, and I meditate on it. And maybe that sounds weird. Meditate on it? Like, what, what's that mean? I don't know how to meditate on God's word. Let me give you an example because you've meditated on words before. If you've ever gotten a love letter from someone or a text from that girl that you've been eyeing for a while, you chew on, on every single word, don't you? You read it multiple times. You pour over it. You let those words hit you. You take them all in. You're meditating on it, right? On my wedding day, I got an envelope when I was getting ready. And in it was this card, and it's from Kelly. She bought this card when she was 16 years old because it says on the front everything that she wanted to share with her husband. She didn't know who she was going to get married to when she was 16. I did. Uh, <clears throat> she bought this when she was 16 and kept it for her wedding day. And then on the inside of it, she wrote me a long letter of why. This thing is so valuable to me now. I keep this in my safe at home. In fact, I was a little, I was nervous taking it out of the safe today and bringing it here because I don't want to lose it. I've read this so many times. Word for word, I've meditated on it. I've let it sink in. I've chewed on it. You want to know what it says? I'm not telling you. Like, are you kidding me? That's for me. That's what God's word is. Think of God's word as like it's a, it's a letter written to you from God saying, hey, this is who I am. I want you to know me. Read through it slowly. Chew on it. Meditate on it. Take it in. Write stuff in the margins of your, of your Bible. I do that all the time. Or my journal. And this has become the favorite time of the day for me. Ever. I look forward to it. And when I don't have it, I can tell I'm off. But it didn't start out that way at all. Not at all. I mean, it took a while for me to start really enjoying this. Reading the Bible was hard. Times I didn't understand it or I didn't want to do it or I just went through it quickly or I just skipped it. Felt like a checklist. It was hard. It was a discipline to stay connected to the vine. But over time, that discipline has turned into a delight for me. When you experience that, that's when you'll really start to see spiritual growth. Not just in you, but other people here too and see it too. Spiritual disciplines are the role we get to play in our own spiritual formation. They keep you connected to the vine, and what you're connected to shapes who you are. So maybe a step for you today is simply, there's a great book to read. There's a book called Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. It's a classic book. It just walks through multiple spiritual disciplines, what they are, how to do them. Maybe it's that. Or maybe it's getting connected to other people that are connected to the vine. Be in a group. Talk about what your disciplines are or what they're not, where you struggle. Ask people, hey, what do you do? How could I do this better? Keep me accountable to this. If you know someone who produces much fruit, I guarantee you they have good spiritual disciplines. Go ask them. If you're already doing these things, this is a reminder for you to keep going. And if this is brand new for you, reflect on what you're really connected to, what your disciplines really are, what they're shaping you into, and maybe you could start something different, something that will actually connect you to the vine. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much that Jesus, you modeled this first and foremost that you want us to be connected to you, you want us to be intimate in a relationship with you, that we know you and we look like you. So I pray that you would give us the courage, the persistence, the patience, the discipline to stay connected to the vine so that you would bear much fruit in us. Give us that joy, let us experience it. We love you in Jesus' name, amen.